Thanks for joining for another episode of Medical Education on DoodleMed. First of all, I would like to give a shout out to the clinical problem solvers for this awesome case and schema. Go check them out on Spotify Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. You're called to evaluate a patient in the ER and they have a calcium of 13.5. What do you do? Okay, here's the case. It's 6 a.m. and you're pre-charting before you round. The first patient is a 65-year-old male who is admitted overnight for neck swelling and difficulty swallowing. While looking through his labs, you notice that he has hypercalcemia, but none of the classic symptoms of hypercalcemia are noted in the ED notes, like whole body pain, fatigue, nephrolithiasis, abdominal pain, or neuropsychiatric issues. On evaluating the patient, he appears to be saturating well on room air. He does not currently have dyspnea or tachypnea. He is speaking in full sentences and does not have any strider. His neck exam reveals a bulky, firm, fixed lymphadenopathy on the left side of his neck with a hoarse voice, but he has no difficulty managing his secretions. He is rushed to a CT scan ordered in the ER, which reveals a large, ulcerated, supraglottic neoplasm. There was no evidence of airway narrowing. However, there was compression of the left internal jugular vein with associated thrombosis. He had been a longtime smoker, and biopsy of the supraglottic neoplasm revealed laryngeal squamous cell carcinoma, and further imaging revealed no distant metastases. His other labs were significant for a creatinine of 0.9 with a baseline of 0.6, albumin of 3.6 with protein of 7. After 2 liters of IV fluid, his calcium decreased from 13.5 to 12.6. His phosphate was 2.2, bicarb was 23 and chloride was 105. So with all these numbers, here's a quick note on attempting to contextualize his labs. Electrolytes in general tend to have friends. For example, whenever evaluating someone's sodium levels, it is important to consider the glucose. Because as the glucose level increases, the concentration of sodium in our body water decreases, and even the absolute amount of sodium decreases eventually due to the two-sodium glucose co-transporter. Potassium and magnesium love to hang out, and you must consider the magnesium level when evaluating the potassium due to the effects of magnesium blocking outward flux of potassium from ROMK channels. Hypokalemia, thus, can be potentiated by hypomagnesemia, by a lack of blocking at those distal nephron channels. So that brings us to what is calcium's best friend. Without getting into the mechanism right now, it's phosphorus. You can look at the interplay of phosphorus with another element when trying to determine the root cause of hypercalcemia. By considering the ratio of chloride to phosphate, such as a high one greater than 33, it signifies that hypercalcemia is due to the action of PTH or PTHRP. This is because the PTH mechanism in the kidney leads to decreased absorption of phosphate and increased excretion of bicarb, and the kidney compensates for that anion loss with increased absorption of chloride, creating a mild renal tubular acidosis. So let's review. The symptoms of hypercalcemia which are classically tested on the boards are summed up in the incredibly nonspecific mnemonic, bones, stones, groans, and psychiatric overtones. However, there is a much more specific constellation of symptoms which can be attributed to hypercalcemia, and that is constipation and polyuria. Once it is suspected or seen on labs, a common diagnostic approach is to utilize parathyroid hormone to conceptualize the underlying etiology of the hypercalcemia. Either you go down a PTH-mediated or a non-PTH-mediated pathway. Within the latter pathway, there are multiple reasons for hypercalcemia, including parathyroid hormone-related peptide or vitamin D. Let's take a moment to review how vitamin D is metabolized and how it affects calcium metabolism. Either vitamin D3 is absorbed through the diet or synthesized in the skin. Then, vitamin D3 is converted to 25-hydroxyvitamin D within the liver, after which it is finally activated within the kidney to 125-hydroxyvitamin D, which is the active metabolite which is what potentiates hypercalcemia. Theoretically, if the hypercalcemia is linked to vitamin D, you'll see an elevated 125-hydroxy vitamin D. However, the precursor 25-hydroxy vitamin D can be used as a surrogate. If there's elevated 25-hydroxy vitamin D, this is diagnostic of excessive vitamin D intake. On the flip side, when there is low 25-hydroxy vitamin D, 
That is indicative of pathologic conversion of vitamin D, which can be seen in some granulomatous diseases and cancers. Another possible culprit of hypercalcemia not attributable to high parathyroid hormone is bony osteolytic tumors. This is often seen in the context of metastatic bone disease, most commonly from breast or lung cancers. Then there's an entirely different category of possible causes such as milk alkali syndrome, hydrochlorothiazides, adrenal insufficiency, or immobilization. Interestingly, the two most common causes of hypercalcemia are states of primary hyperparathyroidism or malignancies. And typically, a very high calcium over 14 is suggestive of the malignancies. The most common causes of an elevated PTHRP are cancers, namely squamous cell cancers and renal cell cancers. Lymphoma can cause an increased 125 hydroxy vitamin D. Rarely, PTH is the mechanism of hypercalcemia of malignancy, and this can be seen in parathyroid carcinoma. Enough diagnostics. Let's talk about the management of hypercalcemia. This really depends on the symptoms of patients and the severity of hypercalcemia. For example, in terms of management, if a patient is symptomatic, volume resuscitation is important due to these patients typically being volume down from polyuria. Then calcitonin can be used if necessary, but has a narrow therapeutic window as it tachyphylaxes quickly in about 48 hours. So bisphosphonates can be used in conjunction as they take around 48 hours to work. Denosumab is also a consideration, but typically endocrine should be involved at that point. If the process is mediated by a granulomatous disease like sarcoidosis, then steroids should be very helpful. Very rarely, dialysis is indicated if the calcium is 18 to 20, which commonly coexists with renal failure. Going back to our gentleman with laryngeal squamous cell carcinoma, as expected, his PTH was low at 4, and vitamin D was normal at 50. Based on everything noted so far, high PTH equals some form of hyperparathyroidism, and with low PTH, the parathyroid is not the problem. However, what if the PTH returned within the range of normal? This is a dilemma in medicine that we must be careful with, when a, quote, normal lab value is actually abnormal given the context, like a normal hemoglobin in someone with long-standing renal failure or heart failure. In this context, we must recall that the elevated calcium levels haven't been able to suppress the PTH, which points to some form of hyperparathyroidism. Thus, a low PTH helps us zero in on PTHRP and bony tumors. His PTHRP level was elevated. His hypercalcemia resolved with 2 liters of volume resuscitation, calcitonin, and a bisphosphonate. His squamous cell carcinoma was staged as T4N3M0. Unfortunately, he presented one month later with hemoptysis and dyspnea, then underwent emergent tracheostomy and PEG tube placement. He has had little response to induction chemotherapy, and due to lack of response, he is undergoing palliative radiation therapy to decrease his risk of a jugular venous blowout. Then the plan will be to start nivolumab as a second-line agent in platinum refractory disease.